So hey, what's going on everybody? Josh Cantwell here, CEO at Strategic Real Estate Coach and Freeland Ventures. Back again with you with another one of our student success stories and interviews. I'm really excited to be with you. Um, today, my guest is my good friend, one of my students and one of our regular recurring borrowers uh, that we work with a lot in, uh, on, on the freelance lending side. His name is Brad Crow. Uh, Brad is from the greater Indianapolis, Indiana market. Uh, and Brad is a, uh, a relatively new investor. He's been investing for about three and a half years. Uh, he's a grandfather. He is uh, you know, a regular recurring borrower from Freeland. And uh, I wanted to interview Brad for all of you who are looking at real estate to invest part-time, to do just a couple deals at a time, but still make a very significant income from your flipping and from your rental properties, uh, I thought having Brad on would be a great opportunity for him to tell you his story, his strategies, and what he's focused on so that you could glean some of the successes that he's had and use those in your own business. Uh, so Brad, thanks for joining us today. How are you? Thank you. Thanks for having me, Josh. I'm doing really good. Uh, looking forward for the new year of 2019 and what it's going to bring for the real estate investing market. Yeah, you bet. You bet. The market's still, it seems like things have cooled down in some markets a little bit with the Fed raising interest rates, uh, which is, I think is a good thing. Uh, and there's still plenty of markets that are just, uh, you know, on fire and doing really, really yes. well. So, Brad, actually, why don't you start just real quick. Tell us a little bit about your market in Indianapolis. Uh, you're investing there locally, doing uh, deals there. Uh, so just tell us about the market a little bit so our audience can get a flavor of where you invest. Right. Um, well, Central Indiana, you know, is uh, pretty much where we try to stay around and in. Uh, Indianapolis has the main territory, and then we kind of kind of shop around in the five surrounding counties uh, of Indianapolis. So uh, that gives us a pretty good radius. Um, you know, the market as a whole, uh, at the beginning of 2008, maybe at the end of 2017, I should say, I noticed a change in the market. It stayed about the same of all last year, 2018. Um, we still have plenty of good deals out there in the area. Uh, I can probably uh, go through and find within uh, my region probably two or three hundred deals uh, still out there on a weekly basis. So uh, the properties are still there. Um, I think the HUD market has dried up a little bit more than, than the, uh, can, uh, you know, the regular, regular banking methods are, but, uh, uh, but we still have quite a few deals out there to be found. And uh, so, you know, we found a little niche in, in a certain part of the, uh, of the area that we've uh, probably done a majority of our, our flips on. And uh, we, we focus that area quite strongly because, you know, if you're having success buying and selling, you stay with it until, it's no longer affected, right? So, um, but uh, yeah, so I, I would say, you know, it's, it's not a bad market by any means. And uh, um, I don't think it's obviously like it used to be back, you know, 10 years ago, but uh, you know, but overall there's still opportunity for us. So. Nice. And Brad, why don't you tell our audience a little bit more about your investing strategy? You know, you're really laser focused on just kind of doing one thing and doing it really, really well. So what is your primary income strategy in your real estate business? Well, you know, for the most part, we look at fix and flip properties, single family residents. Uh, obviously those are, those seem to be very plentiful. It's an easy strategy, I guess, to get involved with and find uh, distressed properties. Uh, they're obviously they're on, you know, if you get the ones that are on the multi-listing, you know, they're, they're out there every single day to look at. Uh, so I don't, I, I've just been doing that since day one, uh, thinking that was the easiest strategy for me to attack and approach and, and deal with. And so uh, uh, that's kind of where we focus at is on those type of properties. Um, we uh, we kind of stay out of the uh, good, what we call the super good neighborhoods one, because we find that, uh, at least that I found that the, that the opportunities are, uh, they may exist in some of those higher end homes, but they're harder to buy. So uh, for me, buying houses that are $35,000 to $75,000 are easy and fast, get in, get out quickly, try to, and rehab budgets are not monsters and killers. And 
So, you know, it makes it simple and easy that you can, uh, you can get your, your flips done hopefully a lot faster. So, yeah, that's fantastic. So Brad, you've been investing for about three years or so completed about eight or nine deals and sold. It's about a million two or so in real estate. Got a couple deals in your pipeline now. Um, so I, I like, I like the fact that you're kind of doing this methodically. You're doing this strategically that fits your budget, fits your lifestyle. This is not something that, you know, you, you went out and took on eight, 10, 12 properties at a time, but you've kind of methodically punched these out one after another, after another, and consistently made, you know, a, a, a pretty good profit in most cases between 20, 30, 40 grand. And we talked before we're getting ready for this interview, uh, Brad's got a deal, one of his larger deals that he's working on now that's set to make potentially six figures, uh, even after closing costs and financing costs, walk away with about 70, 75 grand. So Brad, just talk about your comfort level starting as a new investor a couple years ago to now. Um, why you've kind of focused on fix and flips, you just kind of talked about, but you know, how you've gotten comfortable with the number of deals that you can handle uh, relative to your goals in real estate, your income goals, and how many deals you feel like you can handle at a time. I'm curious to know that because a lot of new investors are thinking, well, you know, if I want to make $100,000 a year or $200,000 a year or $50,000 a year, yeah. how can I do that maybe doing just one or two or three deals a year as opposed to doing 15 or 20 or 30 wholesale deals. So just talk about that for a minute. Well, you know, I've always been a bigger fan of the, of the fix and flip because I always thought the potential earnings were going to be a lot higher. Now, I guess I didn't really have a buyer's list to work with. So doing the wholesaling was kind of, I thought it would be a bigger challenge. And even though I may be able to volumize, do more of those, uh, I've just kind of stayed with what I feel comfortable with. And that's, uh, that's, you know, buying and flipping. Uh, you know, I have a strong background in the construction industry. I've been in the con uh, commercial industrial construction for uh, 36 plus years. Uh, so from a management level of it. So, um, and I'm kind of a very much a hands-on type person. So I was really comfortable with, you know, I, re you know, I'm, I remember today getting my first deal. I, I never was afraid to take the leap and get, it was always about trying to find the first deal and then getting it funded, you know? And so, um, those were the things that I felt like were, going to, were my challenges, but I, actually performing the work was never a big problem. I, I pick my battles when I do my rehab. Um, I have a little bit of help sometimes, uh, but I do a lot of things. I particularly finish things myself, um, and uh, I hire my subs as I need to hire them for the largest part portions of it. So uh, initially going in, I thought I could save a lot more money by doing it myself, as I've gone and done fewer and more and more, obviously, I try to use a few more subs in the process. Uh, one, because as a one-man band, sometimes you, you you know you only have so many hours in a day to work with, so you have to kind of pick what you can do and, and how well you can do it. So, uh, if you're a person that's not a handy person, sure, then you got to have good subcontractors that will uh, you can work with and trust and know that they can perform. And so uh, we've leaped the uh, uh, to that end of it a lot more uh, now than what we were doing. Uh, I, I would eventually like to say, hey, as I grow and expand, uh, that I t I, I'm doing less of the hands-on work and, and more of the management and then, you know, looking for things uh, in, for future acquisitions. So uh, to me, my goal was always this, uh, starting out. Get, for, of course, doing the first one was the first one, but – I, I was being, I was being a little kind of, you know, making sure I was doing things in a simple method uh, on the first one. So I just like, all right, but do the first one, get it done, and then close it, and then go buy another one. But since then, I've always had a goal in mind, like, all right, I always wanted to have kind of three in the pipeline. You know, one I'm working on, one I'm selling, and one I'm buying. So that way, it, wheel is always turning for me. So that's where my goal is now. Uh, as a smaller part-time type investor uh, that uh, I've always got something in the pipeline one way or the other. Um, so if I can keep and maintain that, then, then obviously, you know, if you can keep uh, the lulls from happening in between for buying your next property and waiting months uh, for that to happen, because these, you know, these rehabs take, take time. They're, you know, you always have a goal in mind, but that doesn't mean that's how it's going to happen. You're going to get finished by those dates. So, 
obviously we're trying to get them done, get them sold and all, and and, and uh, on the market to somebody and sold by within a six month period is our our objective overall. But uh, uh, sometimes we like to speed it up a little bit faster. So you know, starting out slow is sometimes not a bad thing. Um, it just gets you comfortable, and so you know what the expectations are, and um, uh, you know, and then if you have bigger goals from that point on, at least you know maybe how your how how it works, how the things are going to fall into place, and and uh, you know how you can attack and increase that volume a little bit more. There you go, great, great. So, Brad, tell us a little bit more about your your first step into real estate. What, a lot of people that maybe have a commercial construction background, a lot of our students have some construction experience or real estate experience, or maybe they were a contractor, maybe they were a realtor. They have some foot or some part of their life is already in the housing industry, but they're not a real estate investor yet. So what did you do to kind of get going? What training programs did you take? Webinars did you take? How did you get started as one of our students? Just talk to that for a second for those folks that are really interested in real estate but haven't yet done their first deal. Well, you know, the good thing about it is for me was um, I always had the itch uh, going way, way back before internet was even involved. And I didn't really know how to approach it. But back in, let's say, the 80s, they, obviously there wasn't the access of information that there is today. There wasn't the knowledge of uh, private lenders and investors such as yourself uh, out there. Uh, and, you know, most of the programs early on were trying to do second mortgages and, you know, and uh, trying to get the, uh, maybe the owner to refi the property and, and uh, where you could, you know, pay them and, and take over the property. But um, since then, you know, like I said, the internet's been a great tool, and it, it it opened doors when I when I back when the we had the 2008 collapse. You know, I saw what was going on in the, the housing market, obviously, and there were a lot of houses all of a sudden on the market, and they were they were cheap. They were like, wow, like if I could just figure out how to buy uh, some of these properties. Uh, at the time, I was living in Florida, and there was Florida was one of the higher states hit in the country during that uh, timeline. And uh, it's like, I just was trying to, you know, I trying to find a way how to make, how to do deals. Well, I didn't really come across anything. And I, and I think it was just simple internet search, looking how to buy distressed properties. And, you know, and so I spent uh, a number of months just, you know, gathering the information that I can. I, I ran into you eventually on the uh, YouTube and, uh, saw some of your, uh, what, what, I don't think at that point you, you were doing any funding. I think you were just kind of showing your, uh, abilities, what you were doing with, uh, re, you know, how to rehab houses and buy houses and, and so forth. So I watched a lot of your early videos. Um, I watched a lot of John uh, Cochran's uh, stuff as well. Uh, cause you two seem to be connected a little bit. And, was too. John was a student of mine eight, nine, ten years ago. Yeah, so I, it was a great learning curve seeing some of that, you know. So, um, so that was kind of my thing. I just kind of, I just did, I just watched a lot of internet stuff and went through the process of trying to figure that out. What the what the formula was for buying, how to buy, uh, you know, how to create rehab budgets. That part was pretty simple for me doing rehab budgets because, uh, you know, I use estimated software that I have that allows me to really go in and, and get fine in detail with what my rehab is and not just take a stab at it. Um, but I always, my thing for me is I look at the, I look at the, uh, what the proper is being offered for. I've tried to, once I figure out what the uh, potential retail ARV value of the property is worth, what they're selling it for, how much money does that leave me in there for rehab? And then my kind of go back and say, can I get this rehab budget done for that amount? And then that's kind of when I start, deciphering what the rehab is really needs to be and, and you know what the money that we have set aside for can be if that's enough to cover it and do is the offer is the listing price good or can I buy that list price or do I need to make a counter offer or something lower so once I get all those numbers in my head and on paper I kind of then that's how I approach making the offers you know and so wow. um, that's great Brent I appreciate that yeah I think a lot of people eventually just got to get tied in with a system, right? It's yeah. 
watch webinars and YouTube videos and kind of get started with that like you did. I mean, that's why we put that stuff out there is so, you know, for people looking for that type of information to kind of look at the, those free items and free trainings and free videos. And then eventually, again, if you don't have Brad's construction experience, you, you know, take the time to go through and invest in yourself. The, the greatest return on investment is investing in yourself. Yeah. Right. It's a right. Event or some sort of training program or coaching program that's going to have the highest return on investment of any investment that you make. Um, and that's, that's, that's really amazing. So spend your time doing that. I've invested hundreds of thousands of dollars in myself over the years and it's always, always paid off. Um, Brad, when you're looking at deals now, uh, what, what is your top methods to find deals? You said there's a couple hundred deals out there for you to find and look at. Yes. Uh, and you said the HUD is kind of drying up, but there's a lot of still some bank owned inventory and financing owned inventory. Uh, you're looking for distressed off market deals. What are some of your top ways to find good inventory in today's market? Well, you know, for me, um, uh, I keep it really simple. Uh, that, you know, I know there are probably a lot of different methods a person can go through. Um, you know, I, they say, you know, don't always live and die by the MLS system, but uh, I do use it quite a bit. I have a portal set up, but that's all I receive is distressed properties throughout the state of Indiana. And, uh, you know, I just go through the, my portal that I get on a daily basis, and I, I just look to find those properties that I think that are uh, worth considering. I search them out, and, and you know, I do like everybody else should you be doing if you're not going on the internet trying to find out what the what the real property value might be worth and um, you know trying to determine at that point you just you know do your do your uh, due diligence and try to figure out uh, if it's worth making an offer on this because it's on the market doesn't mean it's right it's worth buying I mean it, you know some property you just can't buy no matter what even if they're distressed or foreclosed but you just got to do your homework and do your numbers and you know, figure out uh, if they fit and if they fit, then, uh, you know, look at it closer and make your offer, you know? That's great. But Brett, are you using some variation of our automated offer formula where we take the after repaired value, multiply it times approximately 65 to 70% and then subtract your repairs and that kind of becomes your maximum offer price or are you yeah. using some variation of that? Yes, that's correct. That's kind of the, the simple guideline that I use, uh, you know, uh, to determine that. Uh, so I'm always trying to make sure it fits in those numbers and those guidelines. Uh, and if you stay there, you should be okay. Uh, I seem to find that uh, most really good uh, distressed properties, if they're in high-end neighborhoods, uh, there seem to be, they seem to be discounted at about 35% of retail value. Uh, the problem I have in those with those type of properties is the banks know that and they don't usually want to uh, go deeper than that. So you got to look at where the property is located at. Um, and uh, if it's really a bad property in a good neighborhood, then great. Uh, this current property that I'm doing right now is exactly that um, time, type of thing. Uh, it's, it was a home that was in a high-end neighborhood, a middle-class neighborhood. And uh, the fortunate thing about the deal was I walked into it just by pure luck. Uh, I saw it listed. Uh, That's kind of luck. Pure I knew, luck. What's that? That's the best kind of luck, pure luck. Yes, it is. And, and, and the thing was, I mean, actually it was under contract. And somebody else had it under contract. But the bank uh, got tired of waiting. The guy could not provide a proof of funds. So I just go to show you how important that little piece of paper is worth. And uh, he couldn't, he couldn't prove it. I could prove it with your, with your system. Uh, and it allowed me to create that proof of funds letter immediately. And uh, the, the same day I was out looking at the property, making an offer on it uh, because uh, like I said, it was a home run. I, I knew if I didn't beat somebody to the punch, somebody was going to beat me to the punch. So um, so that's kind of, you know, how it works sometimes. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. And what Brad's referring to is, you know, we're, we're a private lender. I've funded, uh, over 35, $40 million worth of private lender loans. A lot of that to my students, uh, Brad being one of them. And Brad's been a regular, 
you know, borrower and student that we've created a great relationship with. Brad, we funded what, four, five, six, seven deals for you? I mean, how, what are we up to now? Actually, you've done every single one of my deals. Okay. There every single one of them. So we're, we're on number eight, and the one that Brad's uh, got going on right now is going to be his biggest one if everything uh, works out as planned, as projected, and wrapping that uh, rehab up, and that thing will be on the market here soon. And again, looking at a very high, a close to six figure uh, profit from that deal. Um, we like working with Brad. You know, he knows his numbers, knows his construction numbers, but also knows his market really, really well. Uh, if you're listening to this and you're looking for funding, uh, check out our website, by the way, freelandlending.com. Uh, we are what's known as a boutique private lender. Uh, you know, we're not a, a huge billion dollar lender, but we have lent out. Uh, over 35 or $40 million of my money and my other private lenders' money that we manage. Uh, we fund deals for guys like Brad that really know what they're doing, that are great operators, that we believe in, that are doing uh, great single-family deals and even some commercial deals as well. Um, so, Brad, let me ask you, let's go back to the past for a quick minute. You mentioned you got the real estate bug a while ago in the 80s, but just let's talk about the last three years or so since you've really jumped in and we funded a bunch of your deals for you and you've really kind of got this thing going. Again, still part time, but you're you're definitely moving along at a nice, you know, kind of consistent pace. What exactly were you trying to accomplish by investing part time? What were you either, you know, what pleasure were you trying to pursue? Uh, not just having more income and more wealth, but what did you want that income and wealth to do for you? Did you want to spend more time with your kids and grandkids? Did you want to take more vacations? Did you want to maybe support your retirement income? What was your real motivation to really get going with real estate a few years ago? Well, I would say uh, the real motiv uh, biggest motivation was um, just trying to create uh, a stronger wealth um, with, with the idea of building a stronger retirement. Uh, I'm not that many years away from that, from that uh, timeline, uh, but still got a few to go. But uh, I just thought, well, you know, if I could, you know, build more comfort from for that down the road, uh, then that would be what my objective was. And, you know, I, I have, I have a, you know, back in the, on the back burner is kind of my overall, I have a company type goal that I'd like to build a business and establish it, uh, in, in a way that, uh, uh, you know, that it can actually be a full time line of work with buying, selling, rehabbing, controlling all those different aspects and phases of the job in-house. And so, um, uh, you know, we're st I'm still aiming for that. I'm not uh, looking to try to ramp it up a little bit more. But um, but the biggest thing was I was starting out was like just building, thinking about retirement wealth more than anything was my ultimate goal. So, Got it. Got it. So just supplementing what you've already done, build your retirement income and have more, I guess, sense of security, right? Correct. Correct. Yeah. And whatever happens in the, in between obviously is great too, you know? So, uh, there's always been that fear factor of, uh, uh, what to invest in. Uh, I took a massive hit, uh, a number of years ago back in the stock market. And, uh, I've always been a little bit leery of the stock market thinking, well, everybody that's made wealth has always talked about real estate to me. And so I was like, Hey, got to figure out a plan how to get into real estate where you can create something that's a little more comfortable, a little more safer, uh, and uh, just know the, the proper ins and outs of it. And so that's kind of what I'm trying to attempt to do, you know? There you go. Yeah, I, it's funny you talk, talk about the stock market. You know, I was a financial advisor for a long time, and I have a financial planner now who just helps me write a financial plan for me and my wife and my kids. I don't yeah. buy any products from him. I don't buy any life insurance or stocks, bonds, mutual funds from him, but he helps me write a financial plan, which I really love. So I have a, a thick binder with all my plans of where all my assets are and all my assets are in real estate. But the funny thing is, you know, if I, if I talk to a hundred people that are millionaires from investing, 99 of them made their money in real estate and one Maybe made, made, made their wealth in the stock market. I actually, Brad, can't think of one person in my life, if I asked them, you're a millionaire, how did you save your millions? I can't think of one guy that ever said, I became a millionaire trading the stock market. Right. But I have 
you know, hundreds and hundreds of uh, family, friends, students, colleagues uh, who become millionaires in real estate. Uh, so it, it, it's just a, it's just a funny conversation. You know, like the stock market in 2018 started out like gangbusters. Everyone believed in you know deregulation and Trump's message of smaller government and lower taxes, and that set everything on fire. And here we are at the end of the year, and the stock market actually lost about six percent mm-hmm. in 2018. Um, you know, because there's fears of a recession or there's fears of interest rates going up. And so again. I'm not worried about my real estate portfolio, regardless of what's happening with the government or who's in office, what's going on with interest rates. But if I'm in the stock market, I'm a little bit leery. So I like that sense of peace of mind that real estate provides for me. You hit it right on the head, exactly. I think there's no doubt. I mean, uh, if you buy properties right, you shouldn't be too concerned about uh, having to lose lose money from fixing and flipping a house, you know? So the stock market can't make that guarantee. So uh, right. You know, so yeah, yeah, real, real estate's a good deal. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, as evidenced by your success, which is great. Um, so, bro, let's talk about the future. Let's talk about 2019, you know. Uh, yeah. What are you trying to accomplish this year? Are you still planning on like, kind of methodically chugging along, doing these two, three, four, five deals a year? Are you building a team? Are you growing? What does 2019 and beyond look like for you? Well, um, I'm not, I have, I'm kind of, you know, we did last year, I bought uh, four or five houses like now, I think uh, for 2000, that was the most I bought at one time. Uh, and I've always had a goal. Uh, my goal was going to be somewhere between six and eight for 2018. I think I could have got to six, uh, but I decided uh, at the year end, I wasn't just going to, uh, I was going to try to clean up a few things that I had on the table first, but um uh, you know, as if, if I stayed like I am and I'm just going to be a one man band buying and selling houses. Yeah. I'm probably going to be keeping it in kind of that type of scenario, you know, four or five houses a year. Uh, ultimately, if I really want to build it as a business, uh, then I need to obviously put a, a, a team in place. Obviously my volume needs to go up, uh, and we need to probably double that in some capacity, uh, at the mo at the minimum. So, um, uh, I'm just kind of trying to figure, feel out a little bit of starting out how this year's going to go. Uh, once I close, clean off my plate from some of the stuff I'm still carrying from last year, uh, then I think then I'm going to be uh, uh, trying to go a little bit bigger and a little bit more of is my is my thinking process. So, um, so yeah, so uh, we're looking for for definitely looking to increase the the numbers over what we did in 2018 whether that's deep by two houses or four houses or whatever that happens, but we're definitely going to try to shoot for a little bit higher uh, number uh, on everything we're doing. So there you go. Yeah, that's great. Right. You know, a lot of people are, I think a lot of people get kind of just, they, they totally buy into real estate, which is awesome. But they also think like, I've got to get really big, really fast. Right. I think people fall in love with speed. They fall in love with growth, which is great. Yeah. Right. You always got to remember growth and speed and income relative to your goals, relative to your lifestyle. Not everybody wants to work, you know, 50, 60, 80 hours a week, just going like a freight train pursuing their goals. A lot of people I know are very comfortable doing this business part-time, doing two, four, five deals a year, 30 grand a pop, yeah. uh, you know, 40 grand a pop times five. That's a, that's a nice six-figure plus income. Sure. And lots and lots of personal freedom, right? Um, to me, real estate's about personal freedom. It's not really about the income I make anymore. It's about personal freedom to be able to do what I want, coach my kids, see yeah. my parents, that kind of stuff, right? So right. W- 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 on a personal level, outside of income and wealth, like w- what do you want real estate to do for you with that personal freedom? What kind of things do you like to do in your free time that real estate allows you to do? Well, you know, it's always exciting to be able to, to take vacations when you want to take vacations, go places you, you've never been before, you want to go to see and have the ability and means of doing so. Uh, and so that's always, you know, my little bit of the, my family personal satisfaction from that perspective, you know, is uh, enjoying life to, to the fullest that you can enjoy it with, whether it's, you know, you and your spouse 
or you and your family or your grandkids or whatever the kid, your children, whatever the case may be, you know, but uh, definitely looking to, to seek the rewards from that, you know, uh, obviously, you know, cash, cash is king. So it buys everything. You can't, uh, unfortunately you can't live life without it in some capacity. So whether you need it to support yourself and pay your bills, pay your mortgages, whatever, you still got to find means of doing that. So, um, um, so yeah, I think our, in general, you know, that's just trying to have, live life comfortably, enjoy the fruits of, of success and, um, uh, you know, and just, uh, keeps, uh, for me, it's just continue to try to grow. Like you said, my father, it's not trying to, uh, try to make it all happen in the first six months. You know, sometimes it takes years for businesses to get to a level where, you know, you feel like you can keep taking on more costs and more debt, more, you know, revenue, more everything, you know? So, um, uh, and, and sometimes it's better to take that walk, you know, simple, slowly with, uh, uh, with, with trying to do, you know, 20 or 30 houses a year, you know, so. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I agree with that. It's got to be, it's got to fit. It's got to fit with your goals. It's got to fit with your personality, the lifestyle that you want. As long as it's a fit, that's all that matters. Somebody wants to do 20, 30 deals and make all kinds of money. That's great. I've been there. I've done that many times. I also know uh, some of the sacrifices that comes with that and some of the time that's committed to that and a team. Oh, you have yeah. to build. Uh, and I also know what it's like to keep things very, very simple um, and sometimes, you know, that the great thing about like the way I look at it is God created us in a way where, uh, you know, one of the, one of the beautiful things about life is simple and secure and having consistency. And also God also created us in a way that we love variety and we love new things. And it's that balance between consistency, security, having regular recurring things in our life that we can count on. But ultimately, if you have too much of that, life can get a little bit boring. So then we have this little bit of insecurity where we want to go try new things and, and maybe expand a little bit. And as long as, when I tell my students, as long as they're managing that in a way that's their, what's comfortable for them and their family, that's all that matters. It's not about what the next guy is doing. It's about what they're doing for themselves. Right. Um, so Brad, as we kind of wrap up here, kind of, you know, round third base and kind of head for home. Uh, Tell us a little bit about maybe a deal that you're working on now or maybe a crazy deal that you are you completed, that you finished, or maybe a deal that you didn't do that you're glad you didn't do. Uh, we all know that not every property is the same. There's probably deals that you wish you would have done, maybe a deal that you wish you didn't do, or a deal that you're working on now that you're really excited about. So tell us about that. Yeah, you know, it's kind of funny because uh, I guess, I mean, when you, when you start doing deals, it's amazing what you learn from each deal, uh, from from the process of buying the property, the acquisition, and closing it, to rehabbing it, to even going to the closing table when you sell it. And always, there's always different things that happen. I mean, uh, you know, there's no two properties that uh, have this, the exact same type of things going on with them. And some of these things you don't discover until you – you take the lid off the can and figure out what's inside of it exactly, you know? And so you're like, Oh yeah. Yeah. So this kind of happened right now, the property I'm currently working on, um, that, uh, I knew it had some issues with some things uh, we saw some potential structural issues, uh, uh, some interior walls. Uh, and uh, as we got in and started digging around deeper, the house we saw was, uh, had been at one point in time, it had been infested with termites. And um, this was my first one of dealing one with this magnitude of any kind, whether it's personal property or investment property or whatever. And it's like, wow, you know, this is, uh, this is pretty, uh, pretty uh, amazing what's, uh, what happens with the fact of termite damage. It's, so we opened up walls and then we figured out, oh, wow, we've got, a, how's, this, how's this roof even standing up is what our question was, you know. So you find those type of things. And then we found, and I found more so, but if you get up in the attic, you start crawling around, right? You find out, oh, oh the house was covered in mold on the, uh, on the decking. And so we had to strip the mold off of it. We had to tear out the walls and build in new walls. And, uh, but it didn't scare me. You know, it wasn't something like, oh, man, panic time. What am I going to do? I got to, you know, this is going to cost me so much money. I figured the ways of doing it, the best ways of doing it, what it was going to cost me to do it. And then I, I knew what my budget was. And if I had some, 
some sometimes I've got some slush fund in my budget. I can kind of move things around and spend it for this versus that, you know. And so we do that. We did that, and uh, anyway, we accomplished at the we're, we're accomplishing at the end what we still plan to do from day one. And uh, but you just never know what you're going to run into house. Same thing, you know, plumbing issues. You don't know how well these pipes are going to be frozen or not frozen. I've had a lot of well uh, issues with houses, which you can never determine how much pr issues are going to be with wells. But until you try to turn the water on, then you figure out, oh, I got a bad pump, or you may have to even drill a new well. But you know, it's kind of you just can never tell. And I've kind of also been that way about houses with pools. I'm always a little leery about buying a house with pool because I know I don't know what the pool was in operation doing before it got shut down and winterized. Did somebody winterize it beforehand or did it get winterized after the fact? So those are things like that kind of make me a little bit apprehensive because I never know. I know there's potentially high dollars that could fall into some of these categories. But like I said, no two houses are the same. You learn from each one. And, and you learn even from doing a home inspection when you're selling the house, because sometimes there's always new things that come up there that you didn't anticipate that you're going to have to even fix after you've got a contract on the, on the property. So you just deal with them one at a time uh, and uh, figure out the best means and ways of, di of taking care of it. And it all works out in the end usually. So there you go. And that deal with the termites and the mold, that's the one that we funded that you're yep. in the process of finishing up. It's going to be your biggest deal to date, close to a six-figure income. So even with some of those challenges, still, you know, big pot at the end of the rainbow, which is exciting. Which is Correct. Exciting. So, Brad, last question. You know, if you kind of look back at this, you know, little career that you're building here last couple of years, um, or even looking back in the 80s when you first got your kind of caught the real estate bug, is there anything that you would tell your younger former self, uh, any advice that you'd give back to yourself or give back to our audience as they look at real estate or they're looking to build their portfolio and build their business? Well, you know, I think the thing is uh, for me was um, don't uh, be afraid to take that first dive. Um, it may look overwhelming. It may look scary. There might be a lot of if questions. What if? What if? But you know what? Just have a good plan, a good strategy. Uh, know exactly what you, you know, what your numbers are. Uh, pe try to be very precise as you can on your budget because you don't obviously want to see massive budget overruns. Um, so try to stay to that budget. Um, and, and that's kind of how I, I just – I, I, I still use that same approach today, you know, and whether I'm buying one houses, two houses, three houses, you know, I don't, it's all the same for me when I'm doing that. So uh, just be patient. Um, just know your numbers um, and um, don't be afraid to reach out and ask questions to anybody that you, that uh, maybe you uh, know of or, or, or friends with. And, and, you know, there's always support out there if you don't know the direction to take. There's always support to get from somebody that will help you get through that process. Yeah, you bet, you bet. Brad, that's great. Thanks so much for joining us today. I want to leave our audience with some resources. Uh, try to do this on every call. And so, uh, you know, if anybody that's listening to this now or in the future uh, wants to reach out specifically to Brad, if you're in the Indianapolis, Indiana, the greater Indianapolis market, uh, I want you guys to connect. Whether you want to join venture on a deal or become a private lender for Brad, uh, or you have maybe you're a wholesaler, you could send Brad some inventory for him to buy. Uh, so Brad, if somebody wanted to reach out to you and ask questions or do a JV or be a private lender or something like that, uh, what's a good way to reach out to you? How should they connect with you? Sure. Uh, well, you, uh, you can reach me at my office number, uh, and that number is 317-774-5222. I also can be reached through my email at uh, brd period pro at gmail.com. Fantastic. So, yeah, Brad operates uh, outside of the Indianapolis, kind of in the suburbs, does a fantastic job. Um, I want to give you guys some another resource as well. Definitely reach out to Brad and, and touch base with them, network with them, and hopefully you guys will do some deals together. Uh, as Brad and I have talked about, we funded a number of deals for Brad been a very uh, successful investor and borrower with us 
We like to fund his deals, always knows his numbers really well. If you're interested in looking for funding for your deals, you can visit us on our, on our website at freelandlending.com. Uh, fill out the inquiry there. Uh, as Brad mentioned, we also provide a proof of funds letter. He's able to log in, print off his proof of funds, kind of customize that for each deal he's doing, which he told the story about and make sure he got funding for that deal that he was able to buy when someone else couldn't perform. So check out freelandlending.com. Uh, and then finally, if you're looking for some resources or some coaching or not really sure what to do, uh, check out our website at joshcantwellcoaching.com. There you can apply to be one of our coaching students, joshcantwellcoaching.com. Again, if you go there and you kind of fill out the form, again, there's no cost, no obligation. And our coaching students, we vet out through an interview process. So if you'd like to know more about how to go from intermediate to advanced or new to intermediate, or advanced to super professional and managing you know, tens of millions of dollars like we do, we can help you from brand new investor all the way to super advanced with our different programs. So check out joshcantwellcoaching.com. Finally, you know, Brad, great job in the interview today. I really appreciate your time. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate you having me on. You bet, you bet. So guys, this will be up in YouTube. I'm sure this will be up in iTunes as well. You can find us at Strategic Real Estate Coach in either one of those platforms. If you enjoyed the interview, uh, leave us a five-star rating uh, and leave us some comments, questions. We'll monitor that. If we get a good question in there for Brad, we'll feed it out to him. We'll get a response from him. Uh, if for any reason you didn't like the interview, leave us a five-star rating anyway. We appreciate that. All right? So thanks so much for being here with us today. Brad, thanks so much. We'll see you again soon, my friend. Thank you. All right, you guys, take care. Talk to you soon.